Good morning. How are you doing today? It is so wonderful to be able to gather with you again and to continue. Today we're actually wrapping up our adult education hour on the art of neighboring. I hope that you've found this to be not only informative, but encouraging and giving you some ideas of how to, uh, how to love your neighbor. So let us begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that we are to gather. We thank you for your command to love one another and for the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we ask that as we go forth in our day-to-day -day lives, that we would take this command seriously, noticing who our neighbors are and engaging with them as you call us to do just that. We ask that your spirit would guide the remaining time that we have together in this class and that you would inspire us to love our neighbors as you have loved us, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and to go forth proclaiming your good news to the ends of the earth beginning in our own neighborhoods. Lord, we lift all of this to you, thanking you and praising you through the name of the blessed Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so quick recap of what we've been doing. So when we started this class, we made these maps, these block maps with our house in the center and then these squares all around our house, trying to see if we can fill in who is our neighbor, that immediate neighbor in our neighborhood. And hopefully you've been able to get the names, maybe a little bit of information about your neighbors. The whole intent is to be connecting with those that God has placed us in the midst of. Um, it's been very exciting to hear some stories from some of you. Uh, you've taken the opportunity to email me or text me, uh, letting me know how you've been using this block map already, which is super exciting since we're supposed to stay very distanced from everyone, uh, that you're, you're still able to use this block map and put it to uh, practice, whether it's calling people around, seeing if they need groceries, how they're doing, sharing the gospel with them, uh, the love of Jesus with them, uh, checking in. Some of you have used this block map or a form of it of who you are near, who is your neighbor at church. I've heard from many of you that you're, you're calling and reaching out to uh, some of the people you know here at Living Word, which is awesome. We, we are neighbors um, in this community. We're neighbors in our own neighborhood. So it's really great to see that you're putting this into practice. Uh, I love, I got one video of a family, an impromptu family dance party. Our family is our neighbor. They're our most close and immediate neighbor that we certainly should be sharing the love of Jesus with. Uh, during this time, it's really cool to see how we've been able to reach out in new and different ways and that God has opened so many doors for us to connect with different people, connecting with our neighbors, connecting with our community, even though the world is trying to keep us isolated. Uh, God's word goes forth, God's love goes forth, and it is really, really cool to see this. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep reaching out to your neighbors, keep checking in with people and helping out how you can. So we, we've been using this block, block uh, map. I encourage you to keep this and keep working through it. Keep getting to know your neighbors. You'll notice when someone moves in or moves out, right? So it's just an awesome opportunity to kind of keep in front of your face who you're living around, who God has placed in your lives, who you've been placed in their lives by God. Then we talked last week about that that art of moving from stranger to acquaintance to relationship. When we know our neighbors' names, they're no longer strangers. But how do we go from stranger to acquaintance? We talked about that last week, about different ways that we can connect. We talked about block parties um, or creating an environment or a space that we can connect with our, our neighbors in a manner that's easy, that they're, it's very easygoing, very natural. Um, a block party or a gathering of any sort um, is going to uh, really create that atmosphere for engagement and for talking um, with our neighbors. Then we also talked about speaking with people without an agenda. 
of course we want to talk to people about Jesus and as I said last week you have every right you have the authority and you have the call to speak to people about Jesus absolutely you should never shy away from it but to do so with an agenda is very um, inauthentic and it's very uncomfortable and it can turn people off right I think that we've all experienced uh, someone asking us, do you know where you're going to go if you die? You, that's, that's not a good, that's a very agendaed way of trying to share Jesus. And it's just not a good way. I'm not going to try to be nice about that. It's just not a good way, period. So don't, don't go into the conversation with an agenda. We do want to talk about Jesus, but are you engaging with your neighbor with an ulterior motive or with an ultimate motive. So ulterior is when we keep something secretive, we keep it intentionally concealed. It often involves manipulation. People can tell when they've been manipulated. You don't like it, your neighbor doesn't like it, let's not manipulate people. It's when we're saying or doing one thing in public, but then we have a different intention privately right? The ulterior motive as opposed to the ultimate motive, which is that eventual or longed for destination. The ultimate motive is always, as a Christian people, it's always to share Jesus, to reach people for Jesus, right? We had the sermon a couple weeks ago about Paul with the greater purpose. The greater purpose in all his relationships with people was to reach people for Jesus. It's the same thing or should be the same thing in our lives. Reaching people for Jesus, though, should never be manipulative and it should never be a surprise for people, right? They shouldn't be shocked that all of a sudden uh, that's the only thing you talk about, right? Um, it shouldn't be manipulative. Jesus, think about this, Jesus was not manipulative in sharing himself, right? He wasn't. He, who, he was who he was, he presented himself as he was, and he didn't manipulate people into following him. He would say, come follow me, and they would, right? Um, but he, he wasn't manipulative with inviting them or with reaching out to them. We shouldn't be either. So how do we share Jesus? And how do we know if we're not being manipulative or if we are being manipulative? And this is where I'd like to again remind you that we have three witnessing classes or workshops. We have the Everyday Missionary course with Steve Burke, where we're looking at who our mission field is, right? Then we have the Everyone His Witness workshop that I lead, um, and that's really the how. How do I share Jesus with people? How do I do this in a non-manipulative way, authentic, intentional, loving, non-judgmental? And then we have the Everyday Boldness workshop that Steve leads, which is really that um, do, just do it. So we have the who, the how, and the do. I really encourage you, if you have not taken those workshops or classes, to do so. It will be very beneficial for you. Um, I, every time I lead the Everyone His Witness, I, I come away going, oh, I love this workshop. There's so much good material here, and it's, it's really so easy to do. Um, when we're engaging with our neighbors in a real way with authentic care and concern, there's no ulterior motive. We are living what is shared in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. So let's open up our Bibles to Matthew 5. That is um, the first gospel, so the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and, give, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. When we share our lives with our neighbors, with anyone, they see that we aren't perfect, right? But they also see the, that something is different, that our faith 
affects our lives. Our faith affects how we do life, how we share life, how we engage with others in our lives, and, um, and how we live on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's look at verse 16 again. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It is not our light that shines. It is the light of Christ in us that shines. And it's that light that directs us and directs others to glorify God. It's never for our own glory. It's always for the glory of God. So up to this point, we're going to shift into today. Up to this point, when we've talked about the art of neighboring, we've really studied the pros, like why we should be good neighbors, why we should love our neighbors, and the goodness that comes out of it. I mean, we have so many wonderful stories of, of how being a good neighbor um, affects lives, impacts, impacts lives, and impacts and grows the kingdom of God. And that is wonderful, and we should always rejoice in those stories. But when we start to get to know people, what happens? We start to really get to know people, right? Real people have real life issues. Sometimes when we encounter the real lives of people, we remember why we've avoided getting to know them in the first place, why we've tried not to be a good neighbor. Now, I have not met a single person yet in my entire life who did not have some sort of messiness or difficulty in his or her life. Now, this can be relational, like relationships. It can be difficulties in health, in finances. When I say that everyone deals with messiness or difficulties, it's not an indictment of individuals. It is a matter of life when we are in a world that remains under the curse of sin, which we do, right? There is sin in this world. And so everyone is affected by it in one way or another. It's not a matter of whether or not we're bringing the messiness into our own lives. Some things are just out of our control, but it does not mean that we won't have difficulties, that our neighbors won't have difficulties. When we begin to uh, find deeper relationships with people, it's really natural for some messiness to arise. It's the reality of, um, of life, of who we are and what we experience. So the art in this then, in this neighboring, is going to be uh, knowing about boundaries. Boundaries are going to be key. How we can love our neighbor genuinely without being taken advantage of or without crossing a line, okay? Um, there's a book or there's a story in the book, The Art of Neighboring, where it talks about how uh, this couple had moved into a neighborhood. They got to know their neighbors. The neighbor across the street, uh, they were having marital issues and the husband reached out because they had a connection, right, through neighboring. They had a connection. He reached out and said, my wife and I are in a big fight. Can I crash on your couch for, for a night? And so this couple, wanting to be good neighbors, they said, of course. They had a couch in their basement. They welcomed him, welcomed him in. He spent the night. But then one night turned into another night, turned into another night. And several weeks later, he was still crashing on their couch in the basement. Well, they gave him a key. They said, you know what? You're staying here right now. Here's a key. Now you don't have to knock on our door every time you want to, you know, every time during this time period, every time you need to come over, um, here's a key. We, you know, this will just make things easier. So after a few weeks, this man reconciled with, with his wife. He moved back in with her, and then three weeks later, they had another huge fight. She kicked him out, and, uh, and in the middle of the night, the original neighbors, they heard a noise. Well, it was this man. He had used the key that he had been given when he was originally crashing on their couch, 
and he was coming in and he just said, oh, we got in a fight, I didn't want to wake you. There's a huge line that has been crossed there. The boundaries had not been set and they were very, very much needed. Some of the pitfalls that we can find in being a good neighbor are neediness, so you're only 40 feet away from your neighbor. If a problem arises, you're there. And that's great. But sometimes this turns into you becoming a crutch, right? Uh, there's a man and a wife, another story in the book. They were, they were wanting to be good neighbors. They reached out and engaged with a single mom and her teenage daughter. And the teenage daughter missed the bus one morning and the mom called the, the wife um, in the neighborhood called her and said, my daughter missed the bus, can you drive her? Yep, okay, well that happened a few times. It turned out she was oversleeping. And it was not a convenient thing for this woman to be a chauffeur. She had two small children of her own, and so they had to sit down and set boundaries. This, this woman and her uh, teenage daughter had become very needy and using this couple as a crutch. Oversleep? call this new chauffeur, right? So they had to set boundaries. Um, another pitfall of being a good neighbor can be dependence. When there's unresolved pain in someone's life, they want to share with anyone who will listen. When we show interest, it opens that door that really should be opened by a therapist, by a professional. Most of us are not trained therapists, right? And we need to know our limitations. We need to know our boundaries. Don't steer clear of people who need help, right? It's, this is not saying don't, don't engage with anyone who needs a therapist. No, that's not at all what I'm saying or those who are hurting. I'm just saying know your limits, know your boundaries, set them. If someone truly, truly has unresolved pain, if they are in a depth of hurt, you know when it's over your capabilities, when it's over your head, over your skill set. Uh, I know Pastor Ibel and I are very clear that we, we are here as biblical counselors, we are not here as therapists, because we don't have that training. We are not licensed therapists, um, so we, we can give biblical counsel. It's the same thing with you reaching out to your neighbors, right? If you are not a trained therapist, uh, don't, don't let yourself become one, right? Unless you get the training for reals. Anyway, um, and then another pitfall of being a good neighbor is um, our difficult crises. So on the whole, when we're in our neighborhood, we see the surface of people's lives, right? We see that lawns are mowed, kids look to be well fed, they still have lights on so their bills are getting paid. Um, but when we start to get entwined in a neighbor's life, we get to know about life under the surface. And as we learn more, we can start to feel responsible. We can start to feel responsible for those people. If you see any of these pitfalls, the neediness, the dependence, or the difficult crises, if you see these showing themselves, you need to take a moment, recognize the unhealthy aspect of these relationships and then re-examine whether or not you've set boundaries and how to set them if you have not yet. Boundaries, defined by psychologists, doctors Henry Cloud and John Townsend um, in the book named Boundaries, uh, boundaries, they say, are what define us. They define what is me and what is not me. A boundary shows me where I end up and someone else begins. So boundaries define the terms of what's allowable or not in any relationship. When we love God and we want to do the right thing, it's really easy for us to forget our own limits. Very simple, but it's important to establish the norms and expectations in relationships. Boundaries are not a bad thing. It's important to have boundaries in our relationships. So we can think of a boundary as the difference between re being responsible to someone and being responsible for someone, for a person. So we're going to look at this little list, okay? So being responsible to 
a person is healthy. It means we're responsible to love them, we're responsible to encourage them, to bless them, to pray for them, and to serve them. That is all very healthy. This is all being a good neighbor, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Being responsible for another person is where we get into that unhealthy category. Uh, it means we're mistakenly uh, thinking we're responsible for their well-being, that we're responsible for someone else's finances, that we're responsible for their spiritual progress. Maybe we feel like we're responsible for the strength of someone else's marriage and so on, et cetera, et cetera. We are not responsible for the outcomes, the consequences, the emotions, the feelings, the reactions, or the choices of other people. Set that boundary. It's really, really difficult when you have a servant's heart when you have great mercy for others, when you want to help, when you want to love your neighbor, it's very easy to blur this line, right? Um, that's, that's not an indictment on you. We're having a lot of non-indictments today. Uh, that's, not, that's not saying that you're wrong for feeling this, right? It's just saying, let's recognize these boundaries and know that this is healthy where we're responsible to another person, but it's not healthy to feel responsible for another person, right? Um, so uh, let's go to Luke chapter 10. So we're in Matthew, scooch on over to Luke. So Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 10. And we're gonna start in verse four. We'll be in verses four through 11. Uh, oh, I'm in chapter 11 there. Whoops. Okay. So this is, this is when Jesus sends out 70 disciples um, to, to places where he is going to eventually get to. So Luke 10, chapter, or chapter 10, verses 4 through 11. He said to his disciples, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. The disciples did as they were told. They did as they were called to do, but they could not force anyone to believe. They could not force anyone to welcome them right? They weren't responsible for people's reactions to them. They were not responsible for those who rejected them. This is, this is, we find this a lot in scripture. Um, in Acts 13, we had it. In Acts 18, we had it, where it was that dusting off the clothes or wiping the dust off the feet. It was uh, a sign of, I'm not responsible for this right? Not responsible for. They were responsible to. They were bringing peace. They were bringing the gospel, but they were not responsible for the reaction. Um, so that's really important to think about. Uh, we are not here for handouts, right? We are here to walk alongside those in need. When we're setting boundaries, it's really easy to second guess ourselves. We can ask ourselves, have I done enough? Could I have done more? Am I doing too much? Is there something else I should be doing right now? But remember that boundaries are for your own protection. The devil will use any way he can to make you doubt, mistrust, or allow yourself to be used. And when we get caught in those tra trappings, we start backing off. We start backing off our care of our neighbor and we start backing off sharing the gospel. The devil is tricky, right? He wants us to blur these lines 
so that we end up with an unhealthy relationship with people and we get burned out and we back off and we no longer are as uh, outgoing with the gospel. We're, not as, we're no longer going forth as we are called to do. As a good neighbor, the greatest gift that we can bring, the best way we can love our neighbor is to introduce them to Jesus. That is the kindest, most generous, loving thing we can do for our neighbor. And don't forget that Jesus is the only one who is responsible for people. He is the only one responsible for and to humanity. And he is the only one who can bring healing to our neighbors or to ourselves. Another aspect in a healthy relationship with a neighbor is going to be the give and take. Even though you may be the first one to engage with your neighbor, it doesn't mean that that relationship should be one direction. It also doesn't mean that you need to be the one, the only one, I should say, maintaining the relationship. It can be really difficult to receive from others, but a healthy relationship and an enriching relationship with our neighbor, it's going to be two-sided, right? You are not sent into your neighborhood to rescue your neighbors. You are sent to relate with them and to bring the love of Jesus to them. Jesus is the one to rescue us all. We are bringing that good news. We are not actually rescuing anyone. Neighboring is also not charity work. If you're the one doing all the giving, then your neighbor may feel like he or she is a pet project or a charity case. And it diminishes that relationship. It takes something out of that relationship. Good neighboring, instead of having it one-sided or uneven, good neighboring is really going to bring a sense of community into your neighborhood and a sense of friendship and relation into those relations that you have with your neighbors. Have you ever heard the saying, a doctor makes a terrible patient, right? I love that saying because it's so true. Ha, ha, ha. No, I love doctors. Um, really, we as a Christian people, we want to do, we want to serve people, we want to help, help, help. And this can really make it easy for us to become terrible recipients of God's love through others' service to us, right? When we want to just do, 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 and give, 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 it's really difficult for us to step back and receive that love from God through others. We have neighbors that have put, been put into our midst. Maybe we are supposed to be that recipient at times, right? A few reasons that the authors um, of The Art of Neighboring suggest that receiving can be a challenge. The first one that they suggest is humility, because when we're receiving, we're acknowledging that we need help. It can be very humbling, very difficult. We want to be the capable ones. We're the ones bringing the help. But we need to get help to sometimes too. To have needs it can be kind of unsettling, but uh, as God's people, we can have humility, we can be humble, we should be humble, and we should also be open to receiving from others. Um, another, another difficulty can be that we don't want to impose on others. We're taught to not be in another's debt. So if someone does something for us, we feel that we owe them something in return. Now, we know that when we help our neighbor, when we love our neighbor, we aren't doing it because we expect something from them. We aren't doing it because we want them to owe us, right? Well, the same is true. Have some grace for your neighbor. If he or she wants to help you out, you are not imposing on them. If you uh, would rather be watching a TV show but your neighbor needs a babysitter for a couple of hours, you may want to rather watch your TV show but you're willing to help out your neighbor. 
The same is true. Your neighbor may want to do something else, but be more than willing to help you out, uh, out of their love for you. So um, we're not always imposing on others. It's not a bad thing to ask for help. We don't want to bother someone to go out of their way just for little old us, but we would be willing to go out of our way for them. It can be the same in reverse. Another uh, challenge with receiving can be vulnerability. It takes a lot of courage to put ourselves out there and to ask for a favor or admit that we need help. To be vulnerable is very risky, but it's also opening up that door for authentic and true relationship. Giving and receiving is a natural part of community. It's how we're built to be in relationship with others. This is how we are created, to work together, to help one another out. Let's turn to Luke 7. So we're already in Luke. Let's just go back a couple of chapters. Luke 7, um, verses, starting in verse 36. We're just verse 36 through 38. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. The woman offered Jesus all that she had. Did Jesus need anything from her? No, he didn't. He is the Son of God. He doesn't need anything from us, but he showed us how to receive. He received that love from her. She needed to be able to give it to him. Others in the room thought it was very excessive, that it was inappropriate. She was a sinner. Uh, she shouldn't have been doing that, but um, but he received her gift. He received her service because it was what she needed to be able to do, right? Um, we look to Jesus how to serve because he serves everyone and he was always serving. But we also see how he received as well and how we can receive. Um, we need to keep mindful that Jesus served and serves in a way that we cannot. We are not Jesus. We can't serve in the same way that he did, but we can receive. In Mark verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 45, it says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ serves in a way that we cannot. He served as the sacrifice for our sin, he served to bring us at once, at one with the Father, and he served to give us his own spirit so that we can serve others, so that we can love our neighbors. And the final thing we're going to talk about in this Art of Neighboring class is that uh, this does not have to be an artwork uh, that is very um, in. in I can't think of the, in, <laughs> I can't think of what the word is. I'm going to say it wrong. It doesn't have to be huge and very detailed. How about that? <laughs> um, so close to making it through. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be monumental. It doesn't have to be this huge undertaking, right? We think that the only way that we can make a difference is by being uh, a big deal, by doing big things. But the art of neighboring is really about the simple. It's really about the minutia, the little stuff. We are fascinated in our culture and we're fascinated um, in this society with celebrity, with talent. We praise anyone who is famous for their philanthropy. We praise anyone who has a little bit of celebrity when they do good deeds, when they serve in any capacity. But then we skip over the little guy. We skip over the person that we don't know because we don't know them. 
and they, we don't celebrate them. We think that we can't be the little guy, that there's an unworthiness to it, but loving your neighbor most likely won't play out as an action-packed thriller, right? Loving your neighbor is not going to be the movie that people pay money to see. We go to the movies to see action, to see a lot of stuff happening, bigger than life sort of stuff. That's not how loving your neighbor is going to look on a general day-to-day -day basis. The world you live in, your household, your neighborhood, your community is affected for the better by the little things that you do as you engage with your neighbors, as you love your neighbors as yourself. God has gifted you with the skills and the interests that will guide you in reaching out and loving your neighbors. Some easy ways to connect might be baking or cooking, uh, playing sports, Right now, maybe it's online video games. I don't know. Um, watching sports or TV shows together. Having a Bible study together. Doing the simple things and connecting in the small ways make a huge and everlasting impact. And that is how we are called to love our neighbors. It may not feel like you're doing anything big or monumental, or maybe it won't feel like you're doing anything at all, certainly nothing interesting, but lasting change comes in our lives through investments, through small investments of time, of skill, and of interest that add up, end up making a big impact on our lives, making a big impact on our neighbor's lives, and making a big impact for the kingdom of God. I hope that this study has been helpful for you. If you have any uh, thoughts on how we can engage with our neighbors at this time, I would love to hear it. I love to hear the stories. I've been hearing stories all week long, um, and even before that, of how you're bringing the love of God to your neighborhood. I love hearing it. It's so wonderful to see God's word continuing to go forth and to see his love continuing to work through us. I ask that you would not give up, that you would keep keeping at it and keep loving your neighbor as yourself. God bless, and I cannot wait to be with you again.